Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through Letters from the Dark Volumes 1, 2, and 3, which is a series of zines written by Chris Powell for Shadow Dark. These are really cool. They're in the same vein as the Cursed Scroll zines, so they include the same sorts of things. The first one is Out of Time. This is Volume 1. This is January of 2024. They, I think they've all been released in 2024 so far, so they're coming out really, really rapidly. Now, there's three of them. I think the fourth is on its way. This one is 52 pages, and it deals with sort of a, well, a, a planar adventure, planar setting with uh, some really cool, with, with a cool uh, adventure dungeon attached. The second one is Slayer's Moon. This is grim, dark, really gothic horror. It's sort of more like Ravenloft or something like that. And then the last one in that, this is 70 pages. And then the third one is Tales of the Fae, and this is 64. And it deals with a, you know, like a, a typical, not typical, but a fey world. And um, it also is a hex crawl. Oh, this one's actually kind of two hex crawls built into one, but I'll come back to that one. Let's start with uh, Out of Time, which is the first volume. Now, this one's, the, again, the shortest. It's the least interesting of the three, but I do like it a lot. There's a lot of cool things in here. There's a new class, a, a whole adventure with some dungeons there, and uh, new monsters that you can find for that game. And every every one of these zines, each of these zines so far, is sort of additional rules that you can, can add into a game. Um, so it's designed for Shadow Dark, and the layout is according to the Sursa Victory style. Yeah, the layout template by Sursa Victory. This is by Chris Powell. Um, and I like it how each introduction is written by a different person. <laughs> this one's written by the Arch Wizard Blevard, or Blevard. And the artwork is all, as far as I can tell, um, written by the, uh, well, the people here. Um, so I think that's really cool. Um, one of the weird things about this book that I just noticed is that one of the artists has my name. I am not associated with this at all. <laughs> so I just want to make that clear. This is not me, but it is uh, interesting that I, I literally just noticed that as I'm looking at it right now. That's really funny. Okay, uh, moving forward, we have an introduction by Blevard, Archbishop, Archwizard of Freeport, uh, the 31st of Anand, 1487 AH. It's an in-world introduction with what this book is. So it has the class, the evoker class, as well as details on the eight planes uh, of the multiverse. And then you get Ebon Peak Academy, which is a sort of wizard school. And there are things that you can run into here, dealing with the Catharian mechanism, Catharos, the Lord of Time. And then there's lots of monsters from different planes going on there. So in order to fully uh, engage with this book, you need also the Curse Scroll 1 and Monster Monday 3, which are uh, include things for this adventure. Or things that this adventure uses, I should say. Good table of contents with, uh, you know it, hyperlinked uh, entries, which I always love. Great artwork as you go through. I really like the artwork in this book. New rules, so new options for players and game masters, and there's great quotations on many of these chapter headings. Uh, there's the Evoker class, which is an interesting class. It's it's not... Hmm. It has some decided downsides from the wizard. So I can... It's not it's not just simply a replacement for the wizard, and it, it doesn't seem to, in my opinion, or my view so far, step on its toes too much. Um, it's much more about damage, and uh, just sort of like outright explosion and stuff like that. So it's a it's an evoker, as you might say, but sort of divine, or not divine, it's like a plain touched, and that's where it gets its magic from. And the way that it does magic is slightly different. One of the cool features that it has is this idea of spell burn, so if you fail and you lose a spell, you can still cast it, but you take some damage. Uh, and then there's a, a few new spells for the evoker, and they don't seem to be too strong, I mean, four start is just magic missile, but better, except you don't have advantage on the roll. So it's a d6 instead of a d4, but you don't have advantage uh, built in. And then you get a breakdown of the planes. It's pretty short for each of them, but I like it. It's kind of cool with the structure of the plane, the inhabitants there, the magic you might run into, the dangers of it, and how to get to it. That's pretty cool. The different, All the different planes you might run into that an evoker might be drawn to or be built on It'd be kind of something you'd want to know for that class with new backgrounds based on the different uh, realms really cool just a d6 for each of them but if you have a uh, an evoker with a particular connection you can have a particular background for them or if you had a setting that made a lot of sense you could use these again for anybody but i think it makes most sense for the evokers great art there 
Uh, and then you get a sandbox adventure for fifth level characters, Evan Peak Isle. That's one thing I really like about this and the second is that the adventure that's built for it is higher level than first level. We've seen a lot of low level adventures out there. This is great. So it's an interesting little uh, map of the island there, along with the um, a breakdown of what the place is. And then you get the, the place itself. Uh, it's Evan Peak Academy, there's a laboratory, a fortress, and then there's some other stuff going on. Now one of the things that I think would be really cool here is to, because this is sort of plain adjacent, planescape adjacent, not planescape necessarily, but I think this would be really cool to use in something like a planar compass campaign. I've reviewed planar compass before, it's, it's a setting for old school essentials, it's sort of spell jammer, right, where you're sailing from island to island on these flying ships. I think this would fit really well into a spell jammer setting. Because, or into that uh, that um, planar compass, because the creatures you're running into are very, it's very high magic, very, you know, plane jumping. There's teleportation circles, there are creatures like being shunted in from other dimensions. There's a lot of like obvious plane hopping stuff going on, and it would make a lot of sense in a, in a spell jammer setting. In a regular D&D, or even I would say Shadow Dark campaign, the tone is a little bit higher, more high magic, more high fantasy, more kind of ridiculousness then Shadow Dark tends to go into with a much more grim dungeon-crawling thing. Although you don't have to do that, obviously. But it seems to me it would fit really well with something like a, I think, with a, uh, yeah, Planar Compass campaign. Where instead of just being teleported to this island, you actually just fly to it. So I would maybe add, like, instead of a teleportation circle, I would just add, like, a sky dock. And then you'd have that all fit, and the rest of it could just go as normal. Or maybe there's a teleportation circle and a sky dock, you know? And here's the island with a breakdown of the different locations, as well as random encounters, and they're really cool. So the, the bell and the Evan Peak Ta Fortress rings might draw you there. There's a dragon there. The Pegasus, who's from the stable, he can land nearby. You have these Hedrones, which are really funny. I like them. They're basically D20s flying around. A Tindalos, which is a reference to, I think, an H.P. Lovecraft creature, the Hound of Tindalos. But this is like a mechanical hound that hunts you down. A Yithian, which are these kind of weird creatures. I think that's the creature on the cover. They're here to loot, basically. And then there's an owlbear, which you got to have an owlbear. You have a breakdown of the factions. There's Crixie Pigfoggle. Name's kind of crazy. Uh, there's an amber golem that she controls. There are the monitors, who are basically Katharos is this is the god of order, god of time. And he has sent these mechanical celestial foot soldiers so uh, to go out and to kill all the humanoids on the island because the background here is this... The mage, this time mage, is trying to use a Catharian mechanism and uh, did so without all of the cogs. So there were seven cogs, but she only had six of them. And so everything started going downhill very quickly. All these time dilations and time problems, and that's uh, an element of this dungeon, which I, I think is kind of cool. As you get closer to the machine, the time starts to distort in interesting ways. Some ways that are a little hard to, it'd be hard to adjudicate at the table, but they're really flavorful and really cool. And then there's the Yithians, who are knowledge-seeking aliens who have come to loot. I mean, they're trying to preserve information, but they're they're uh, interested in looting, pretty much. With random encounters. And the random encounters are cool. They're not just like... I mean, there's a couple of them that are just monsters. But, like, a Yithian mistakes the party for an Evan Peak faculty. For Evan Peak faculty. Or a lesser water elemental and fire elemental want help freeing their friends on the second floor. Or a Tindalus ambushes. You have a glitched... Or a clockwork soldiers. Then you have a glitched hedron that instead of wanting to kill all humanoids, wants to help all humanoids. Or a steam elemental burst from behind the wall. Echoes of eldritch incantations, the amber golem comes in. Confused Neanderthals and a triceratops materialize due to a rift in space-time. A rat who has extreme intelligence and the power of speech. Uh, really interesting stuff on that, for the most part. Here is the dungeon, first floor of it. Pretty straightforward. Different entrances, lots of ways to go through it. Um, very open. You can approach this kind of any way you want, and I think that's really cool. There's no really set path. There are a few of those, okay, first door on the right, second door on the right, third door on the right moments, where there's no real, it doesn't seem to me, any clear reason to pick one room or the over the other for the players, at least just from appearances. But what's in the rooms is really interesting, and again, it's, it's open in that once you get a sense of what the place is like, or maybe you're talking to someone, and they can tell you what it is, or you could put plaques on the doors to the different rooms so that they know what they're what they are. That would give you some help. And each of the rooms is named, so you could do that. There's the foyer, the dining hall, the scriptorium, the alchemy lab, the divination room, the first floor boiler, cloakroom, the gallery, information, storeroom. The storeroom's great. There's an anti-gravity field in there. A library, the orrery tower, also really cool. Uh, practice range. This one's really funny. So because the hedrones, 
have been programmed, they've been told to kill all humanoids. Well, the practice range has an illusion, an illusory orc that you can see if you press a big red button. So it keeps on creating the illusion and killing the creature because it thinks, oh, this is there's a humanoid. They keep having to kill it. And so it's just stuck there, uh, continually shooting at this orc, which isn't real. I think that's funny. There's a rec room workshop, second room, boilers, tunnels, and all this stuff. Carixie's laboratory. This is really cool. I like the, this place. It's more straightforward, though. The map is just, you know, going through room to room. There's, you know, experiencing this room, then experiencing that room. It's not looped or anything like that. So this isn't my favorite. But what's going on in each room is kind of interesting. And the reason that it's done that way is because in the first room, there's a puzzle that you just can't solve. And then it is kind of deus ex machina solved for you. But then later on in the dungeon, that's explained because it's actually a time paradox and you solved it later. And so you let yourself into the lab <laughs> in terms of time. That's one of those things that would be hard to adjudicate, and some players are going to just hate that idea of the time paradox. It'll drive them nuts. Uh, I, I know that that kind of, I don't know, there's a certain element of my mind that just has to not think about that because it will bother me. Because um, it's impossible, right? You know, like, it's a paradox that can't come to being. I'm, I'm not even going to go into it. Uh, so, anyway, that's one of those paradoxes that can't exist. It's not really a paradox, it just wouldn't happen. Leaving that aside. Uh, but one of the things that it says is the forces of causality prevent you from moving on without opening the doors for yourself. I don't know how it would do that. Maybe there's like an explosion and you get thrown against the thing and you press the button. Like, you'd have to adjudicate it and it would have to be a little railroady because I could definitely see a party of players being like, nope, I'm not going to press it. I'm just not going to press it. Maybe you make it so that like the doors of the lab all open at the same time if you press it and that's the way it does it so it opens them all for a minute and then closes them all. I could see something like that happening. But anyway... Just a bit of a gripe, <laughs> but not really a gripe. It's a funny moment, and I think it's kind of interesting, but it's a time paradox. Uh, then you have the mechanism itself, and what happens if you defeat Crixie in combat? It's a pretty straightforward fight. I mean, you're just going there to fight her. She's not going to do anything but fight. She's gone crazy by studying this cog, and by studying time and trying to figure it all out, she's gone crazy. So she's just going to fight you. And then Katheros is happy with you because you've stopped her from doing her um, nonsense. And uh, then you have, but listen, the interesting thing is it's not just one dungeon. There's a couple dungeons here because you have the school and the lab, but you also have the Ebon Peak Fortress, which is nearby. Much more combat it seems to me. You're fighting Hedrones, Clockwork Soldiers, Tindalos, uh, Rat Swarms, Void Spiders. There's a dragon here, but he's actually not an evil dragon. He hurts you the first time you see him, but then he apologizes profusely and he's trapped in this draconic form. And he's like, uh, I, I saw that these hedrones were supposed to kill all humanoids, so I used this thing to turn myself into a dragon, and now I can't get out. So now he's just a dragon here. And there's no solution given to how he could po polymorph back unless you can get a potion of polymorph. But, um, but that's beyond the adventure. He's a desert dragon. Um, and then you get some of the new monsters from this adventure. You get a couple of a de a devil, steam elemental, Crixie herself, the golem, the amber golem, the living rug, a witten, which is a spirit of a ghost that's gone mad by time, and then the Githian. I think that's something from H.P. Lovecraft. Monitors, clockwork soldiers, and the hedron itself. Those are the hedrons. <laughs> I like that. And then the Tindalos. Uh, with combating ability and legal stuff, and then notes on the next issue, which is Slayer's Moon. So, a really cool introductory adventure, or introductory, you know, um, inaugural issue of Letters from the Dark. I, I really like this one. It's the cheapest of the three. I think this is only five or six dollars. The others are maybe seven or eight. I'll have to, I don't remember exactly, but I'll put the links below to where you can get them. Um, but let's look at the second one, which is Slayer's Moon. I really like this one. I think it's it's a really well done adventure. There are a few things, nitpicks that I have with it, but for the most part, I think it's quite, quite good. The introduction is another person. Each of these introductions is by an in-world person who is different than the others. I like that. Once again, we have the table of contents, which is hyperlinked, and a content advisory, because this one's dark, and it's got some stuff going on. Great art there. Uh, very, um, you know, Puritan, very uh, Solomon Kane esque Characters with new options for characters with the Slayer. Slayer is kind of like the monster hunter side of Ranger, um, which is kind of interesting, and they get special abilities based on their prey, their kind of prey. They get to pick one, and then as they level up, they can choose, instead of getting talents, they can choose to roll on this table and get additional advantages against... Now, it's not just against their prey. So, for example, angels, if you pick that as your your prey, you have advantage on all ranged attacks against airborne enemies while they're flying. Not just angels, but against any 
uh, or demons and devils, you take half damage from fire. So it's more, it's broader than just being able to fight that one creature. You also get some abilities about that type of creature, but it's broader than that. You get some new weapons, holy water, a lance, and a stake, as, as well as rules for silvered weapons or silvering weapons. Uh, these seem pretty cool. Holy water is a one-use bomb, 2d6 damage for ranged, um, and uh, cannot be sold for money or else it loses its blessing. That's really cool. I like that. The stake is interesting, too. If you get a critical hit against a vampire, you paralyze them for d4 rounds, and it permanently destroys a vampire at zero hit points. That d4 damage means it's basically a dagger with a diff with an additional ability, but you can't use um, dexterity with it, and you can't throw it. So it's a trade-off. And I, I like that about, so far, all of the different classes and magic items and things you find in these books, uh, in these, in these um, zines, they're not simply power boosts as far as I can tell, to the standard Shadow Dark stuff. They almost always have good trade-offs for them. It's not like it's not like an obvious upgrade. Oh, of course, I'm just going to use stakes instead of daggers from now on. It's like, no, there's a reason to use daggers. There are some priest options. You can substitute Turn Undead at level 1 for one of these spells. Bind Undead, Blood Rage, Bulwark, Aura, Consecrate Water, Cornucopia, Equilibrium, or Exercise. And then there's a few new witch spells from Cursed Scroll, which you can use. And they're kind of cool. I like some of them. Walking Hut... The insole object, a beast speech, dancing fever, and war water. Kind of interesting stuff. And then some new tools for Dungeon Masters, including diseases. The name of the disease, the cause of the disease, this DC for it, and the effect of it. And then Night Terrors. It's an interesting random table to roll on when you want something creepy to happen to your party during a rest. There's a rule here for, like, Ravenloft-esque tarot readings and, like, I don't know. It's used in this particular adventure. Um... And you get the Valley of Lugos, which is a hex crawl for 5th to 7th levels. I really like this one. As you can see, the map gives you that look of um, Cursed Scroll with a lot of hex, a lot of locations on it. This is a very big hex crawl with a lot of locations with rumors, encounter zones, and encounters in it. And then you get the hex key for particular places. Now, one of the things I would say about this hex key is that there's a lot going on here. And so you could play a good campaign here, but sometimes the, the tone isn't quite gothic horror. Sometimes it is. Very much. But there's a few that I'm like, this doesn't really feel gothic horror-y to me. Like the Grosh army. There's just a bunch of berserkers and barbarians hanging out in this valley. Um, and they don't seem terribly gothic horror to me. But a lot of the others certainly are. There's the Solomont, which is an evil school led by a demon. Um, there are shrines. There are werewolf caves. You're looking at you know, lots of werewolves and things like that going around. Uh, there's ghosts and ghouls and... Uh, yeah, just interesting creatures running around this place. One of the things that's kind of funny here is that there's this idea of uh, a sme. I don't know what this is exactly, where it comes from, but it's this shape-shifting serpent that can breathe fire that can chain into, change itself into a handsome knight. And he goes around telling everybody that they need to rescue these damsels who are being held by a serpent in a cave. And then when they go there, the damsels are actually just this thing's wives, and it turns into the dragon, dragon and then eats them or burns them, whatever. Um, and they hoard the items. This is great. I, I like this a lot. It's a funny idea. It doesn't seem gothic horror to me. It seems much more fey. And it's interesting because the next zine is a fey zine. I think it would fit better in that game. But you might say that it's higher level than that zine uh, is. That zine is for level 1 characters. This is for level 5 to 7. So it's more appropriate for higher level creatures. So maybe that's why it's included. But it doesn't seem to me to be in tone with the rest of it. But it's really, a, I mean, that's a total nitpick, as you guys can, can, can tell. Um, the idea here overall is that there is a lich and a vampire who are married. It's kind of funny. The lich, uh, in order to fulfill her bargain that she made her a lich, she has to marry seven guys and offer their souls to her patron or to her, her demon dude. And the vampire needs to drain the blood of his victims. Well, the lich can't die and become, he can't, there's no blood, and he doesn't have a soul. So neither of them knew what the other was when they married, and now they're trapped with each other. It's kind of funny. And they're trying to destroy each other, but they can't really do it. And they're, they're, so they're in the same castle. They've got minions that are helping each side to one or the other, and they're, they're really hate each other. They're, both are going to try to use the party to destroy the other. So that's kind of cool. I like that. And then there are factions that are you know, interested in slaying one or the other. That's kind of cool. But it's a little funny, right? And if your tone is really grim gothic horror, if you introduce it, if they, if they find the story, then they're going to probably laugh. 
And that could create a kind of a tonal jarring moment, unless it's played well. So you'd, you'd want to consider that, right? Either play more of it tongue-in-cheek and make that be kind of a funny moment, or um, maybe change something to make it more in tone with a serious background. But here's the background of their marriage um, and the factions that you run into. The Count Brasov and Duchess Dragomir. I love the art for each of them. And then you get some art there for a chimera. And then the castle and how it's laid out. Um, along with where Duchess Dragomir's spirit is, because it's you know, she's a lich, so something is something um, has her soul in it. So you got to find it, destroy it somewhere in the castle, hidden. Uh, the map of the castle, pretty straightforward. A little bit of the, I go to the first door on my right, well, a lot of on the second floor especially. I go to the first door on my right, I go to the second door on my right, I go to the third door on my right, like a lot of that. So that's not my favorite dungeon design. But it's still cool, and it makes sense for a castle. It's going to be laid out in kind of that more... Um, you get the keep in the center, or in this case, a garden in the center. Uh, and then the sort of things built along the walls. What's going on here is pretty good, pretty straightforward. You'll notice that every room has a, uh, a card deck association, and that's because the spirit vessel might be there, right? And that's where... Um, that's what it would be in that room, depending on what it is. So you can go through and, and, and figure all that out. But the, that means that the descriptions of the rooms are a little longer than what's actually there, for the most part, because the spirit vessels are not going to be in every room, uh, only just in one. You get Dragomir's Court, uh, and then you get the basement, which is where the, uh, the guy is, the vampire is. And there's an illusory floor. I really like the illustration there. It's very helpful to see. It reminds me of some of the illustrations from the old Ravenloft adventure. Because this obviously takes massive inspiration from that. There's an interesting magic, uh, anti-magic field with a, with a dead flying carpet and a dead dude. Well, it's not dead, it's just deactivated and a guy who tried to fly, and of course he uh, plummeted down when the anti-magic field took effect, and so he died. You can go down and get a uh, magic carpet. It's pretty cool. There's the mausoleum with a whole bunch of possible caskets you can open and find stuff in, Count Brasov. And then um, the children down here have been taken. That's one of the kind of plot moments as you're trying to find the children. There's other stuff going on. That's a great piece of art. I love that one. Very pulpy, very old school, uh, just great. I love that one. The new monsters to hunt Lugos Valley, to haunt Lugos Valley or your own adventures. And they're pretty good. The Cap Can, Cap Cowan, Cap Cowan, Amuma, Mortolia, Samka, Smay, Slayer, Smayek, and vampires, and different kinds of vampires. I might steal some of these from my Curse of Strahd campaign, because there's some really cool ones. Uh, the uh, the Mesmer, the Maroi, the Prickolici, a hound written by a vampire. That's really cool. And a vampire sting bat. Another interesting things you get here, another interesting thing you get here is this vampire quirk list. Um, that'd be kind of cool. You add this in, so not just, you know, different folklore traditions of vampires have different things. So you can only move by hopping or healed by moonlight. Obsessed with counting small objects like grains of rice or sand. That's kind of cool. You could use that and give your and give a weakness to your vampires beyond the traditional Western vampires, which you know can't cross running running water, can't enter a building without being invited, that sort of thing. So this is the uh, and then a page on the back with cultural depiction, apology basically, or not apology, but like a warning, and then the compatibility and legal stuff, and then uh, introduction to the next uh, zine, which is again tales from the Fey, tales of the Fey. Uh, Letters from the Dark, Volume 3. This is really cool. I think this is my favorite of the three. It's a great one. Got a lot of good ideas. That hex crawl is awesome. And 70 pages of material. Really good. And the next here is Tales of the Fae, as I said. This is, as it might sound, it's a Fae world. Um, with fairies and a sort of a parallel dimension thing going on. With a really interesting little poem, Tales of the Fae, by Izzy Fae Child. Starts off. Once again, you get that front matter, and it's all hyperlinked. <laughs> interesting art there for the Fae. Characters, new options for your players. You get a trickster class, which is kind of an interesting spellcaster. Um, they have randomized spells. They don't always get the same spells. Um, that's kind of interesting. And then there's a, sp a specific table for mishaps, for Fae mishaps, including things like getting a luck token and having advantage on other spellcasting checks for the next round. So it's not all bad, actually. A faithful fairy you can get. So it's actually pretty good, some of the fa fairy mishaps. That's pretty cool. Now, the trickster sheet is a little more complicated, so they have a, an extra character sheet here for you if you want to play that class. Now, there's a new ancestry, the gnomes. Well, two new ancestries, deep gnomes or forest gnomes. And then some great pieces of art there. And then game mastery rules. So how the fey realm is structured and the inhabitants there, how magic works there, different details about it as you go through. 
with some vague quirks, because when you go there, uh, if you're not used to it, stuff can happen to you. You're sort of a side view of the Fey world. Some art there for it. And then Crisis in the Glens, which is a hex crawl adventure for first level characters. Now, what you'll see here is that there are two, essentially, hex crawls. There's one set in the Material Plane, and one uh, that's Ballyhob Glen. And then there is another, as you go through it, which is set in the Fey Realm, which is parallel to Ballyhob Glen. And it's essentially the same region, just done in a, you know, in the Fey world, and so things are going to be Fey there. That's really cool, this idea of parallel dimensions. One of the things I wish they, I wish they did more with it in the zine. You could obviously add more and do more with it. But in particular, the castle, the kind of dungeon that's developed here, is um, not parallel. I mean, you can go from one to the other, but the layout isn't the same. And in one sense, that makes sense. It wouldn't be exactly the same. One is created and one was sort of like a fake. I mean, they're both created, but they're created in different places. But it would make sense to me if they would be mirrored. And that could be really useful, right? You go into one and you can learn the layout and then you can use that to your advantage. In the other one, I just think there'd be a lot you could do with it. The dungeon is here. It's two interlinked dungeons for third level characters, so it's a little higher than first. The hex crawls for first, but when you finally get here, you'll probably be third. Courts of Trickery. With the background of the current situation, uh, the Archfey Morgana is taken over both, and she's not good. And you have to try to you know, fight your way through the normal one, Castle Pendar, and try to maybe rescue some people, and find the pathways into the other castle, and then use those portals to then try to rescue the, the good fairy, who is trapped in the Fey realm behind a mirror. Really well laid out dungeon. I like that. Very well looped. Very interesting. But then once you go to, as you go through, it's an interesting dungeon. I like it a lot. Pretty straightforward. But once you go to the other one, see, it's, it's looped really well, but it's not identical. It's not the same place. And I think that's a mistake. I think it would be cooler to do the same map in the two places. But, you know, it's not a big deal. It's not a huge deal. This is super cool, too. And you can uh, definitely use this dungeon. be a lot of fun. Titania has been imprisoned, and you've got to try to rescue her by the Archfey Morgana uh, and King Killian. The Rainbow Room, Painting Room, Fairy Fountain, a great piece of... I think that's probably public domain art? I don't know. But that's great. I like that one quite a bit. With some new monsters from the Fey Realm. The Barghest, the Dullahan, the Gladysent. Uh, that's cool. Oh, that's a, that's a Gladysent. That's what this is. Yeah, that's a Gladysent. Okay. And then different Seelie Fey as well, and Unseelie Fey, like the Banshee. Tooth Fairy, that's pretty creepy. <laughs> and then uh, the next issue, which is going to be back to basics, the Borderlands. That's going to be mercenaries and hiring rules, keep building rules, and the Borderlands, which is a lawless backcountry yearning to be explored and tamed. So I'm, I'm assuming that's referenced all the way back to uh, keep on the Borderlands, right, get back to basics. So that's Tales of the Fae. And these three together have been Letters from the Dark, volumes 1, 2, and 3. So you have Letters from the Fae, volume 3, or sorry, uh, Tales from the Fae, which is volume 3, Slayer's Moon, which is uh, Letters in the Dark, Volume 2, and Out of Time, which is Volume 1. These are all by Chris Powell. Uh, I, I highly recommend all three. Again, I'm going to put links below to where you can get them. I think these are excellent materials for Shadow Dark. This is the sort of thing we should be seeing. I think stuff by Sirs of Victory, the stuff by Chris Powell, this is the quality of supplemental material that we can hope for, from, we should hope for, uh, from, the, uh, from the Shadow Dark community. There's been a lot of great stuff out there for it. There's been a lot of, I would say, you know, not so great stuff out there for Shadow Dark. This is in the former category. This is excellent. All three great ideas, great monsters, great dungeons, great hex crawls, and I highly recommend you guys check them out. All right. Hope this has been interesting, guys, and I'll see you in another video.